Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us for Bible study this morning. We've been in a, a, a rather unusual study over the last several weeks talking about God and talking about pain and talking about suffering and talking about all the things. We've looked at examples of Job. Uh, well, today we're looking at the suffering servant passage in Isaiah chapter 53. And of course that refers to Jesus who is and was our suffering servant who died for us. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Does God really understand my suffering is the title. Uh, stay tuned to our worship time at 11 o'clock. I'm not sure if we have programming between 10, 30 and 11, but at 11 o'clock our worship time will be on. So join us today for that. So we're going to look at passage from Isaiah 53, <clears throat> which is a very familiar passage. We use it uh, Easter time when we talk about Jesus, our suffering servant who gave his life. Uh, for our sins, and we refer to it often throughout uh, all the time when we go back and refer to what Jesus did for us. And of course, the, it's obvious to all of us, nobody likes to suffer, do they? I don't think I know anybody that likes to suffer <clears throat> unless, <clears throat> unless it's a, a, what I want to say, unless it's a, a, an ailment that people like to complain about, you know, to get a little attention or something. But nobody really likes to suffer, and we may question we may question why relief doesn't come, and we get help. Where's the Lord, and how we want it to be? But we can accuse God of being not being aware of what's going on in our lives. Uh, he's not indifferent to suffering; He knows what we go through. So this suffering servant, Isaiah presented this uh, in in reading about this suffering servant. And there were questions ages ago about who this suffering servant was. Uh, was it Israel? Was it a group of people within Israel? Who was it? But we have come to understand that the suffering servant is, ind indicates Jesus and what he did for us. So he's presented as a person who is unimpressive, a person who's been rejected, a person of no value. And we kind of know how people have been deemed of no value, what kind of people, you know, we blame people for being that. Uh, he suffered and died because of the sins and the transgressions of other people, not because of what he did, but because we did, and because the Lord allowed it. God allowed that. This was a part of God's plan from way back. He knew he'd have to send his own son into the world to bring about redemption and bring about salvation and to be righteous in the sight of God. So, through his suffering, justification, that's the word it came to, justification came to us uh, uh, because of the sin, our sin that he bore. So the servant is none other than Jesus. It is Jesus, the anointed one from God. And his anointing death was God's plan for redemption that brought us redemption. So let's read verses 2 through 4, chapter 53 and see what this says about him. Uh, he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one for whom men hid their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely... He took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. So the New Testament writers and Christians, of course, through the ages, uh, had another understanding that this servant was a, and would be a messianic figure, one that God would send and God had ordained to come into the world for that very purpose, to bring redemption to us. And to bring this ultimate fulfillment, which was found in Jesus himself. He was the one. Uh, recall the story of Philip. You remember Philip um, as he was transported to the presence of the location of this Ethiopian eunuch who was traveling. And he was reading the scriptures that day and suddenly he appeared. And he asked Philip, hey, what's the scripture say? What is it? And it was this passage. So he explained it to him. And he preached Jesus 
And uh, of course, this passage would have had and did have some ultimate meaning at, at the time, in Isaiah's time. But Isaiah was given an insight into the future of who this suffering servant would be and what he would come to do and what he would accomplish into the future of one who poured out his life even unto death that he did. So that God would do a work of salvation through this person, through this servant exceeded anyone's expectations beyond what we could even conceive that God would even do that to a sinful world. Why would God send his own son to do that for sinners, for people of no value? Why? Well, what they saw in the servant was this tender shoot that he referred to out of, uh, uh, out of dry ground. And a tender shoot out of dry ground would, would indicate no potential. It's not going to make it. You can't do a shoot out of here out of dry ground and, and expect it to come up and do anything. Uh, on my drives to Lynn and back all the time in the corn season, they plant, you see all the corn, but on the edge of the road, the turn row, you see a few little plants coming up out there. And you know they're not going to make it, but the seed fell out there and they're going to come up, uh, but not produce anything. So they, they didn't see any value in this tender shoot that was in dry ground. No value. Hey, might as well forget that because it's not going to produce anything. Uh, it was unimpressive. Uh, unattractive for that. So that wasn't going to that wasn't going to work. So uh, he was despised and and rejected, uh, as it says, uh, by men. He was forsaken. We don't have anything to do with him at all. He the people turned away from him. They didn't want to look at him even uh, for whatever reason. Just didn't want to look at. Him. wasn't appealing to look at. And so. What do you do when you come into these kind of conditions or these kind of things that you meet up with? You just want to put it out of your mind. Hey, don't think about it. You know, put it to the back of your mind. Just pretend you didn't even see that or hear that or know what was going on. So they dismissed it from their minds. They didn't want to deal with it. Someone that in that kind of condition, despised, rejected, familiar with suffering, they hid their faces. He was despised and we didn't care for him. We didn't want to see him. We don't want to even consider that. So the word surely comes in in verse 4. Surely. What did he do? He surely, uh, verse 4, sets the stage for a new thought to change the perception of this person. Our perception. What did he do? First of all, he took on our infirmities, um, which would indicate sin. There were a lot of different words for sins in Old Testament especially. Uh, he took on our firmties. He carried our sorrows on his back. He took our sorrows and sins to the cross. He was acquainted with grief because of our sins. He suffered and died for our sins. That heavy burden that he felt. He was punished for the sins of others. Not for anything he did, but for what we did. He punished, punished for the sins of others. And so to the Jews, in no way did Jesus fit this popular perception of what the Messiah was going to be or who this suffering servant was. There wasn't any way that he could be uh, that. It couldn't be a plan of God that God ordained this to happen and to take place at some point. So he was a day able to identify with humankind in every way, in all of its weaknesses, because he knew what suffering was all about. Jesus knew what suffering was all about. He suffered for us. So we can't complain to God if we suffer or if we hurt or if we have pain. Lord, just help us. We know you're with us. We know you care for us. We know you love us. Help us through this difficult time that we're going through. So that's kind of a description of the suffering servant. Nobody wanted to look at him or have anything to do with him. He was an outcast. He certainly wasn't the person that God would send to, to bring redemption to us. So in verses 5 through 9, we're going to move forward in this point that Jesus suffered from affliction and, of course, death, as we know. So let's read 5 through 9. He said, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. 
Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was, like, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. He was assigned to a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. So, whereas they had perceived that the servant had been smitten by God, uh, for sins in his own life, the truth was he was pierced for our own transgressions. That's the truth. There's no way around it. He was crushed for our iniquities. Crushed on the cross. Jesus took upon himself the punishment that we deserve. We are the ones who deserve what Jesus had to suffer and pay the price for on the cross as he died for us. So he paid the price for us. Well, uh, Isaiah realized uh, two benefits because of this servant's substitutionary death. That's what it was, is. Jesus died, a, he was our substitute. He paid the price for us and died. Well, punishment that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. So those are the benefits from what the suffering servant uh, did to us. So it also refers to completely sound and peaceful and friendly a relationship with God and with others. It brought us into the possibility of a relationship with God the Father. Otherwise, we would not have had that opportunity to do that or to come into that kind of relationship with God through what Jesus did for us. We hear the word shalom, the Jewish word, the Hebrew word for peace. It foreshadows the, the abundant kind of life that Jesus promises and that Jesus would offer to us, John 10, 10. Uh, that God came to us as a result of that. So he did pay the price for us. Well, verse 6 is a personal confession and a cooperate acknowledgement of the universality of sin. Sin is everywhere. There's no place in all of creation where sin is not present. It is there. So everywhere you go, sin Sin came into existence in the garden with Adam and Eve. Satan was there to tempt and to get them to yield to sin. It looked so attractive. And so sin has always been around. So as such, we are born sinners by birth because sin is in the world. And so we realize that all have gone astray. It's our choice, isn't it? Our choice. We can move towards God, we can move away uh, from God. So it says, sadly, we have chosen to go our way, haven't we? We've gone our way, not God's way. That, but it's a choice. God has given us a choice. We can say yes to God, we say no to God. We can walk away from God. But most, that's mostly that's the, the, the decision most people make. They walk away from God. We want to live our lives as we choose. But in spite of it all, in spite of all that, God acted in mercy and grace towards us on our behalf. He did that through sending His Son to the world. He knew. Uh, it was no surprise that sin would inherit the world. Uh, it's no sin that God knew that He was going to have to send Jesus into the world to give us an opportunity for a redemption. God, we can't surprise God. He knows everything. He knows what's going to happen the rest of the day and tomorrow and each day until Jesus comes again. He knows all of that. So, uh, there's no surprises when it comes to God. And, of course, there's no surprises when it comes to sin and what people do and yielding to sin and being choosing sin as a way of life. So, uh, in verse 7, the servant remained silent. <clears throat> he didn't say a thing. He was oppressed and afflicted. He did not open his mouth. There's a spiritual, <clears throat> spiritual song. Uh, they didn't uh, talk in reference. It said he didn't say a mumbling word. Not a mumbling word did he utter. So he did not speak. Uh, even though he was oppressed and afflicted, he did not open his mouth. It's like a lamb being led to slaughter. I haven't been around a lamb being slaughtered, and probably I don't want to be. <laughs> 
so I don't know what kind of noise they make. <laughs> but like a lamb led to slaughter, they, that's before the, um, the slaughter part comes. A lamb being led is just going to be, hey, we're going to go eat or go eat grass or go to the water or whatever. They don't know what's in store for them when they walk into where that's going to take place. So it didn't say a word. Not a word came forth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment and all of that. And uh, words that are in vogue today, he was denied due process. <laughs> he, he didn't get a fair trial. We've heard a lot about that lately. I didn't have a fair trial. Denied due process. Hey, this is not right. This is not the way to go. <laughs> so once again, this lamb was stricken for us, for our sins, as he was in verse 8. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendant? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was just cut off. And who shall speak of his descendants? That's the way that saying that the death of the servant didn't matter. Didn't matter. No one gave a second thought. That's how unimportant he was in the minds of the people. Hey, that's just another person, not very attractive, that we don't even want to think about. Just taken to the side and uh, pushed away. Well, so unimportant. It's not really important what, who it was or what he came to do or for whatever reason. And in verse 9, it kind of gives a synonym here uh, for us to think about. It said, uh, he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Uh, if, if you were, it, the idea if you were rich, you were wicked. You know, the rich are wicked. This, that, and another. It's always been a, a train of thought. Uh, especially in the Old Testament. Hey, if you're rich, yeah, you're wicked. But if you're rich, they, the concept was you, God's blessed you. Look at all that you have, all that you do. But Proverbs talks about a lot about the rich and the wicked. Uh, and the servant was treated like a, a, a wicked rich man. And of course, it says, because he had done no violence, the servant, uh, another view is those who abused and executed the servant have buried him, uh, made his grave uh, and with no show of respect or honor. Uh, think about um, that in, in relation to when Jesus was crucified and he was taken down off the cross. Where was he buried? In a rich man's tomb. <laughs> in reference to that. That's, so that's something to think of. But because he had done, <clears throat> he had done no, no wrong and no violence, uh, no guilty actions, he had no deceit in his mouth, uh, no deceptive attitude that he had, God intervened on his behalf. God intervened on his behalf in what he uh, was going to do and what would take place. So Jesus died between two criminals and yet he was buried in a rich man's tomb. So the wicked and the rich. So that's kind of a, uh, uh, a oxymoron we call it. <laughs> oxymoron. And then we come to verses 10 through 12. Finally, we see God weighing in, giving a perspective on all of this and what's taking place in the death of his servant. So let's read 10 through 12. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my, righteousness, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. And will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. So, finally God in, weighed in here, and gave his perspective. Not only was the Lord pleased, but he willed it to be. This was God's plan of redemption for all humankind, who would come forever and forever into this world until the world comes to a conclusion. He was pleased. And verses 10 and 11 explains why God willed and why he was pleased with the servant's death. It gives us the reason. So the Lord appointed the servant as the sacrifice for sin. It was his responsibility 
The servant was willing to give himself freely. Jesus willingly went to the cross. We think about that night. Before he was arrested, he was uh, saying, Lord, um, if there's any possibility, uh, could this cup just pass on over me? Uh, he knew what the human suffering was going to be on that cross. And yet he came to the conclusion, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. So he willingly went to the cross, literally for us. So he gave himself freely. But the servant became the sin offering, as in the Old Testament concept of offering up to God a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus was that sacrificial lamb who offered himself to die for us and as our Savior. So uh, that only happens, though, when an individual is willing to give themselves over to God through Jesus Christ to accept him as Savior. It can't happen automatically just because we're born and we say, I believe in God. It has to come a time of commitment to Jesus as Lord and Savior. So Jesus is potentially the Savior of all the world. But even though it's a free gift of God, gift of grace, we have to respond. We have to do something to accept that gift. We have to respond to it. It doesn't happen automatically to us. So we got to respond in faith for that to be put into motion to where we can experience what God has in store for us. So uh, this blameless servant who gave his life for the sins on, uh, for others and unblemished, like the unblemished sheep, was sacrificed for the guilt and sin of the people of, uh, against God. So three results, unusual results, would occur in following the servant's death. First of all, he will see his offspring. So he will live on to see his offspring. The reference is, is to spiritual offspring. So the spiritual part of that, many, many, many offsprings will come as a result of the suffering servant. Down through the ages, 2,000 plus years, offspring have come forth, people spiritually born into the family of God. So the second of that, in some mirac miraculous way, the servant shall even have more days after his death, more days after his death, prolong his days, in some way even more days, lives on and on, on and on. And the third of those is, <clears throat> and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand, as the scripture says. Um, through the servant's death, the Lord will be pleased uh, and his, or his will be accomplished. And as, as God says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased when he was baptized and came up out of the water. So the servant shall be satisfied uh, with the accomplishments of his soul. His knowledge refers to, and the Lord declared the true reason for his pleasure is my righteous servant will suffer and will suffer and will justify many. He will bear their iniquities. If I can read that right. So uh, that's what he, he said there. And the scripture says, I will give him a portion among the great. He will num be numbered among the great uh, for what he did in giving his life on the cross for us. And then it says... He who had been deprived of everything will be given an abundance of what he will do and has done. The benefits, the benefits of his sacrifice will be shared with the recipients of his sacrifice because he poured out his life unto death. He was willing to do that. So his task was completed. The goal and the purpose was accomplished. And however, it was not a done thing at that point. In time, because it's ongoing, always has been, ongoing forever and forever, this will continue to be. And Hebrews 7.25 says, as we close out, He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him, seeing He ever lives to make intercession for them. So, the suffering servant, what a great, gracious gift that God gave in sending His Son to come and to be that suffering servant and to die for our sins. That's the only way we can be right with God for an eternity. So 
This says a lot to us, the suffering servant. It explains what Jesus really went through when he walked this earth and what he was willing to do in giving his life for us. And he still lives for us today, even to this day. And one day he will come back again. And he will no longer be the suffering servant. He'll be the conquering king who comes to receive his own at that time. Well, thanks for being here today. Thank you for joining us for this time of study. We've got a couple more weeks in this unit of study and talking about suffering and all the things that happen to us as human beings and to know that God is with us in his presence. He cares for us. He loves us, and he's there. He's always there available to help us through whatever crisis we face in life. So join us again next Sunday morning. Uh, stay tuned for worship time coming up shortly. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day for the assurance of your word and the story of what your son did as a suffering servant came to earth to give us the opportunities to be right with you and to be a part of your family for an eternity. Thank you for loving us that much. Would you continue to be with us in those days that we face difficulties and crisis and pain and suffering and all the things that human life brings to us. We know you're with us. We feel your presence. And we pray that you just guide us safely through each, each event and activity that life brings to us. Lord, help us to honor and serve you today and each day. In Jesus' name, amen.